This past week, my daughter, Brookie, and I went on a canoeing adventure, and something happened that I did not expect. We were paddling down the North Saskatchewan River, and uh, we got to a place in the river where the riverbanks uh, were quite, quite a ways apart. The, the river was quite wide, uh, which spread out the water, and the water became quite shallow. And right in the middle of the river, we could, we could see the bottom uh, quite easily. We could see the riverbed and the rocks and the stones on the bottom. And uh, as best we could, we tried to move towards deeper water, but eventually the, the, uh, the riverbed got closer and closer until finally we, uh, we hit bottom. We, we were beached. We were stuck in the middle of the North Saskatchewan River. We weren't moving. It didn't take long to figure out what we had to do. We had to get out of the canoe and walk the canoe along the riverbed in search of deeper water. And so that's what we did. Brookie had the had hold of the rope from the front of the canoe and I had hold of the rope from the back and we walked the canoe for about five minutes until we found water that was deep enough so that we could get back into our canoe and be on our way. The Apostle Paul gives much advice and direction on how to live the Christian life so that we can grow and be blessed with, within the confines of God's will for our lives. Last week we talked about the positive side about how we are to live our lives. But there's also the negative side. There are things that we are not to do. And in our scripture passage today, Paul lays out some of them. He gives us a list. It's a very serious list, and if we openly disregard it, if we insist on doing these things, there are going to be consequences. What kind of consequences? Well, You'll be in the middle of happily living your life as if you were canoeing down what you thought was a, a deep glacier-fed river, and all of a sudden, right in the middle of this nicely flowing waterway, right in the middle of you living your life, you're going to come screeching to a halt as you hit the bottom, as you get beached, you get stuck. Your life grinds to a halt. How so? Maybe it's your marriage. Maybe your marriage is suffering greatly. Maybe it's your career. Maybe your vocation is in jeopardy. Maybe it's the relationship you have with your kids. Maybe it's on the line. Why? Because you have stubbornly insisted on continuing to do these things, notwithstanding the biblical warnings to avoid them. Today, as we, with fear and trembling, consider Ephesians 5, verses 3 to 7, we're going to look at three things. First, why are there things we have to avoid? And we'll see in the Christian life that there is the both, the, the negative and the positive. They have to work together. There can't be just one or the other. Second, what are these things that we're supposed to avoid? Today, we're going to focus on two of the things Paul uh, mentions. Sexual immorality and covetousness or greed. And third, 
and this is from the larger context of the letter, we as Christians are at war. And our enemy, the devil, will use our sin to destroy us, to try to take us out. So we must not be naive and unthinking and careless and fall into a trap. So let's talk about the first thing, this idea that there must be positives and negatives in the Christian life. Last week during our outdoor service at uh, Ren and Heather's farm, we talked about the positive side uh, of how to live the Christian life. And we talked about verses 1 and 2 of chapter 5, the two verses that precede our passage today. And we see there that we are dearly loved children, and, and that's the mindset we are to have as we live the Christian life. We're not to live like orphans. No, we're to live like children. Why? Children have great privileges. And what are these privileges as, as a child of God? We have the privilege that we've been accepted by God. We have the privilege that we have access to him anytime in prayer because he is our father. And also we have the privilege that he protects us even in the challenging and times and, and the struggles and tragedies of our life. We know that God works for the good of those who loves him, love him, who have been called according to his purpose, Romans 8, 28. And so with, with all these privileges, how are we to live? We are to live a life filled with love, with Jesus as our example. We are to live a life of self-sacrificial love. That's the positive. That's verses 1 and 2. This week we come to the negative, verses 3 to 7. And here's the thing. In becoming Christians, there are some things we simply must say no to. And we must remember the whole purpose of the negative is to bring us to a place where we can stand before God and know he loves us because we have become more like him. We must have both the positive and the negative working together. If you have only the positive, if you emphasize and focus only on verses 1 and 2 and ignore the negatives, verses 3 to 7, or vice versa, this is not the gospel. This is not biblical Christianity. The positive and negative have to work together. Let's take an example. Let's consider bitterness. Now, a Christian cannot simply say, I've decided not to be bitter. That's a good first step, but it's not enough. That's the negative without the positive. Ephesians 4.32 says, Forgive one another as Christ forgave you. There has to be a positive that goes along with that. So, as you choose to forgive, the Holy Spirit will soften your heart to help you to forgive. What might that look like? An old professor at Princeton University in the 1800s compares the way God renews the heart with how you would seal a letter back in those days. You had a flame and you had a piece of wax and you had a seal. And what you did is you used the flame to soften the wax so that when you pressed the seal into the wax, the wax was supple and pliable so that the seal 
permanently changed the shape of the wax. And it sealed the letter. In the same way, how do you forgive? There has to be both the negative and the positive. You say no to bitterness. That's the negative. But also, your mind is renewed by the Lord. That's the positive. It means that as you meditate on how much God has forgiven you and what Jesus has done for you, as you think about that prayerfully, the Holy Spirit makes your heart pliable with that truth, makes it soft. The spirit is like the flame in this analogy, and the heart is like the wax, and the truth of the word of God is like the seal. It is a wonderful experience when you meditate on how thankful and grateful you are to the Lord for the things he has done for you. And when you do this, the Holy Spirit works on you and you can just feel the bitterness leaving, the anger leaving your body. Your heart is melted like wax with the forgiveness you have received. That's the positive. So God helps you forgive. But in any true act of forgiveness, of course, there's also the negative. You don't just do nothing hoping that God will forgive for you because he won't do that. God will help you by softening your heart, but it is you that has to choose to forgive. If you're beached in a canoe in the middle of a river, it's you that has to choose to get out of the canoe. That's the negative. But you know what, here's the positive. By getting out of the canoe, by getting your weight out of the canoe, the canoe will rise without you having to lift it. It will rise to the top of the water and help you. That's the positive. But again, it's your job to walk the canoe to deeper water. It's both the positive and the negative working together. So that's the first thing today. Second, let's talk about this list of things not to do that Paul tells us. We're gonna to focus today on two of these items on this list, sexual immorality and covetousness or greed. These things we must, we as Christians must avoid in the strongest sense of that word. Sexual immorality is the translation of the Greek verb from which we also get the word porn, which is appropriate in this discussion. Christians are to have nothing to do with sexual immorality. We are to avoid every form every type, and every suggestion of it. The very idea that we could be sexually unfaithful to our spouses is not even to be entertained. And sexual activity outside of a committed husband and wife relationship is not even to be joked about, let alone pursued. What about porn, someone says? What's the big deal about watching that? You know, it's, uh, it's amazing how, how much we're predisposed in thinking that things that are done in our mind are not as bad as things done in actual practice. 
What do I mean? Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 27 and 28, you have heard the commandment that says, you must not commit adultery. But I say, anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. In other words, sexual immorality that is played out in your head or on a screen, Jesus considers the same as if, had, as if it had played out physically. Watching porn is doing that. And every time you do that, it's like drinking spiritual poison. Sexual immorality of all kinds wrecks trust. It wrecks marriages, pulls families apart. And you will pass on this habit to your kids. The Bible says, flee sexual immorality. 1 Corinthians 6, 18. Flee sexual immorality. But brothers and sisters, I, I would put it this way. Run for your life. Run for your life for the sake of your marriage, for the sake of your family, for the sake of your soul. Run for your life from sexual immorality, all kinds of it, the physical kind, the kind in your head, the kind on the screen. Run for your life from those things. Then we come to greed or covetousness. This means love of money. Paul tells Timothy in, in his first letter to Timothy in chapter 6, verse 10, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. Now, money is not sinful or evil in and of itself. It is not a sin to own money. It is not a sin to make money. But it is a very, very grave sin to fall in love with it. Paul speaks against covetousness as strongly as he speaks against sexual immorality. So what is this love of money? The love of money, Martin Lloyd-Jones says, is both love for the money itself and also for what it can do for you. Love for the power money brings and love for the things we can buy with it. Christians are to have nothing to do with covetousness. Rather, we are to be generous. We're to be a generous people. Proverbs 3 verse 9 says, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the best part of everything you produce. In talking to the Corinthian church about the gifts of money he hoped they would give to the Jerusalem church, Paul encouraged them to be generous by reminding them of a few things. He reminded them that whoever sows generously will also reap generously. He reminded them that God loves a cheerful giver. And he reminded them that giving should be done willfully, not grudgingly, or in response to pressure. Tim Keller relates this fact about the early church regarding these things we've been talking about, sexual immorality and greed. 
He says this, Historians will tell you that there were two ways in which the early Christians completely stuck out like sore thumbs in ancient Greco-Roman society. There were two ways in which they were utterly distinct. One is they only had sex inside of marriage. The early Greco-Roman community thought that was the weirdest thing they'd ever heard of. Secondly, these the early Christians were incredibly generous with their money, both in dealing with each other's needs and also in their care for the poor. One ancient Roman emperor remarked that the strange thing about these Christians was that whereas the Jews take care of the Jewish poor and the Greeks take care of the Greek poor, these Christians took care of everybody's poor. So in those two ways, in avoiding sexual, uh, sexual immorality and avoiding greed, Christians looked very strange indeed to the rest of the world. And Tim Keller adds, when the Christian church, when the evangelical church begins to be just as strange in those two ways, when there's no disunity between these two things, we're going to start to make an impact again. Now, one last thing I'd like to say about these things, these sins that we're to avoid. From the larger context of the letter to the Ephesians and the larger context of the, the New Testament, as Christians, it is clear that we are at war. We're in a battle. And we have an enemy. There is an enemy of our souls who will use our sin against us to try to destroy us. Let us not be naive about that. Let us not be unthinking. Let's be wise about that. The Apostle Peter says in, in his first letter, chapter 5, verse 8, he says, stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. Your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. We are at war. We have an enemy. We can't be naive about that. My grandfather was a soldier who fought in the Second World War for Canada. He very, very rarely talked about his war experiences. But I remember he told me this one story that was, that was almost too hard to believe. He was involved in a certain battle where he was in, in Northwestern Europe. And in between the Canadian position and the German position, in the middle, there just happened to be a source of water. It, it, I, I recall it being like a stream or a brook, or maybe it was a canal. And then when there was a lull in the fighting, when the bullets had stopped flying for a time, there was one German soldier who did an incredibly naive thing. He would just walk down to that source of water, that stream, and he'd wash his face, he'd wash his hands, maybe take some water back with him, and then he would return to his position. He did this in full view of his enemy. It was behavior that was unbecoming of a soldier in a time of war. It was very strange, very risky, very naive. 
like he was tempting fate. And he did it numerous times. And the strange thing is that nobody took a shot at him. Maybe because it was so outrageous, maybe because it was so strange that bought him some time. Until finally it happened. Somebody did shoot at him. And they killed him. He was dead. His naivety led to that. Let me ask you a question, brothers and sisters. What are you doing that is not only in plain sight of God, but is in plain sight of the enemy? What ammunition are you, are you giving him? What risks are you giving him? What, what are you naively handing over to the enemy? Are you walking down naively to your computer to go on your websites? Are you being covetous, greedy, and full view of everybody? What do you think the consequences are for your family, for your life, for your marriage, for your kids, for your job? Do you think your enemy's going to forget about those things? Dear friends in Christ, in the Christian life, there are unmistakable positives and negatives. There's both. The negatives cannot be avoided. And at some point, when you're a follower of Christ, you are going to be tempted. You know this is coming, whether it's sexual immorality or greed, covetousness, or other things. You know it's coming. And you're going to have to stand firm and you're going to have to say, I am one of God's holy people, and I am not going to do this. Why? Not because I will feel more holy than other people, but because I know this is going to turn me into a certain kind of person. It's going to help me to be one of God's holy people. It's going to be, turn me more and more into Jesus. Are you ready and willing to do that? Are you ready and willing to take the negatives with the positives? It's the only way Christianity comes. There's no other way. If you're willing to say no to yourself, there are all kinds of yeses that God is going to bless you with. That's the promise of the Bible. That is the promise of the gospel. Are you ready to do that? Let's do it together. Let's pray. Father, we ask today as we've seen, we have to say no to things. No to sexual immorality, no to greed, no to covetousness. I pray everybody listening, including those whose hearts may be hurting, I will pray that you show us now that if we're willing to come to you and willing to say to ourselves and willing to say no to certain practices, you have all kinds of yeses ready for us. Yes, I will forgive you. Yes, I will accept you. Yes, I will give you more, far more than you could ever give up. Father, we pray you would comfort us today. Those of us who feel guilty, forgive. Those of us who are weak, strengthen and empower. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.